Okay, so coming up today, we will be listening to a number of practitioners. But first up, we'll hear from a man with an outside perspective. Our first speaker has a fascinating background. Born in Uganda, educated at Oxford and at Harvard, he's written for the Financial Times now for almost 20 years. Only last year, he was named Britain's Cultural Commentator of the Year. Please welcome Simon Cooper. Good morning, everyone. And as Rebecca rightly says, I'm very much an outsider, so it's almost intimidating trying to tell you, the insiders, how things are going in the money ball of football, which is what I want to talk about. I want to start with a picture of Nate Silva, because he's really the patron saint of what we're discussing today. He grew up in Michigan, and soon after college, he developed a system for predicting the performance and career paths of baseball players. And then he briefly dabbled in soccer. He correctly predicted 13 of the 16 matches in the knockout rounds of the last World Cup. But of course, we know him as a political analyst. In the 2008 elections, he correctly predicted the presidential winner in 49 states. And last week, he went one bet. He got all 50 states right, plus the District of Columbia. So in other words, Nate Silver won the US election. And he's really, he stands for what we're talking about here today, which is the triumph of the geeks, the rise of data in sports and outside. Except in football, where the number crunchers don't feel so confident. I mean, typically, as you know, a football club in Britain is run by an all-powerful manager who works largely on gut instincts, which he's developed in his years as a player. And he has to believe, I'm talking about the typical, there are exceptions, he has to believe that gut is more important than numbers, because otherwise he's out of a job, or anyway, his power is diminished. So he's not likely to listen to some nerdy stats graduate, and often the data analyst is locked in some back room and not allowed near the manager. And so data has not, a lot of people feel, got nearly as far in football as in other sports. And it's not just the manager's fault. I mean, there's some things we haven't managed to do. In baseball, they found new metrics to identify undervalued players. In football, we haven't really done that yet. That has not succeeded as far as I can see. And also, the most public experiment of a money ball of football at Liverpool under Damian Connolly went wrong. And in a way that, in the eyes of many outsiders, tarnish the whole enterprise of, of a money ball in football. But I'm here to say, cheer up, actually things are not so bad. And I want to start with our first video, which is a sort of basic demonstration of the power of data analysis in football. This, as you'll see, is the Champions League final, the penalty shootout. Peter Cech faced six penalties that night, and he dived the right way to all six. He saved two. And he seems very confident here, or otherwise you guessed right which way that was going. That's one of those penalties where it doesn't really matter whether the goalkeeper's done data analysis and knows which way he's going to shoot. It's going to go in anyway. He doesn't actually save it. He would have saved it had it gone towards the net. He went the right way. So, thanks, that's fine. Uh, data analysis, very arguably, won the Champions League final. After the game, Czech said somewhat slightly mysteriously, I either guessed pretty well or I was ready to guess pretty well. But he wasn't guessing because he had a two-hour DVD of every penalty that Bayern had taken since 2007, presumably supplied to him by the Chelsea data department. And actually, the last World Cup final was very nearly decided by data analysis, too. And I know because I was personally involved. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see the economist in the world, Ignacio Palacio Suerta, teaches at the LSE, who probably knows more about penalties than any other economist. And a lot of them study penalties because penalties are game theory in real life. And Ignacio began looking at penalties in 1995. And by 2010, he had a database of about 9,000 penalties. And I grew up in Holland. I support Holland. And before the World Cup final, I emailed an official in the Dutch camp who I know, and I said, would you like a penalty analysis of Spain produced by an expert? And the Dutch said, okay, put us onto the keeper's trainer. 
Ignacio worked 48 hours straight, you know, pulled all nighters, and he did a report on all Spain's penalty takers in case of a shootout. And he sent it to the Dutch, and on the morning of the final, we got an email from the Dutch keeper's trainer saying, we can use this report perfectly. And I said to Ignacio, but Ignacio, you're Spanish. Are you sure you want to help Spain lose the World Cup final? And he said, actually, I'm Basque, so I'm very happy to help them lose the World Cup final. <laughs> and here's the report that he sent, if we go to the next slide. Sorry, is that one before? No, this, this is it. The key is, if you win the toss, go first, because it's not a, um, the team that starts the shootout has a 60-40 chance of winning. If we go on, please. And that's the most important thing. When you toss, often the shootout is hugely skewed towards one team already, which makes it odd that TV often doesn't even show the toss before the penalties. This is the report that he sent. And 10 minutes before the end of extra time, I'm sitting in the sands in Johannesburg. I'm not even watching the game anymore. I'm just rereading this report, thinking, my gosh, the World Cup final is going to penalties. I might play a hand in deciding this. And I'm practically having a heart attack in the stands looking at his report. And if we go to the next slide, he'd done all the Spanish players. And on, please. And first he looked at the keeper. Now, Casillas, the interesting thing here is he is stronger going to his right. Balls to his right, only two-thirds go in. Balls to his left, 82% go in. And that makes sense because he's a right-hander, so his right hand is stronger. So if in doubt as a penalty taker against Casillas, you might want to hit to his left. And then we get to the kickers. And you see that at this point in the World Cup final, Spain only had one guy on the field as a regular penalty taker, Fernando Torres. Uh, Villa and uh, Xabi Alonso had been substituted. So if we go on, so they must have been a bit worried. And with Torres, you don't know where he's going to hit. And this is an example of what I thought a very good penalty analysis looks like. You don't know where he's going to kick it. He varies quite well. But what you do know, if we go to the next slide, is that he tends to kick low. 76% of his kicks are on the ground. He never hits high. So that's useful information for the Dutch keeper. You want to go to ground quickly. You're not going to hover in midair. He's going to kick it along the ground, probably. But what do you do about the other Spanish players, most of whom have barely ever taken a penalty in their lives? You have people like Xavi and Iniesta who play for Barcelona, where there's always a specialist, Messi or Eto, who takes the penalties. So these guys have no penalty experience. And Ignacio says, based on his database, what people without penalty experience do when they have to take a penalty. If they're right footers, they kick to the keeper's right because that's the easiest way to put a lot of power in a placed kick. Kicking to the keeper, keeper's left is, is unnatural. And what are you likely to do after 120 minutes in a World Cup final when you're not an experienced penalty taker? You're going to do the easy thing. You're not going to try anything funny. So he thought they would be more likely to kick to the keeper's right. Useful information, I thought, reading this. And then Iniesta scored and Spain won the final and there were no penalties, so it didn't matter. But the point is, it's a really powerful report. And as you know, other people have done this kind of work on corners, stoke with throw-ins. And I think the next step is free kicks. And more particularly, we're going to rule out one of the huge inefficiencies in football, which is people blaming direct free kicks at goal. I mean, do it if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, but for most other teams, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, what happens when a free kick is given is the team's star player grabs the ball and he makes this great big show of placing it and he steps back and then he whams it into the crowd behind the goal. And if we look at the, um, these are the infrequent penalty kickers, if we look at the next slide, this is where people shoot from in, in the Premier League. And there's a great many shots from this area outside the box. People think, and they have in their minds, the ball that flies into the top corner beyond the keeper's reach brilliantly. And that is a very powerful memory, and because it's a powerful memory, it distorts reality. Because only 2% of shots from these zones just outside the box go in. It's a pretty hopeless way of trying to score. More particularly with free kicks, you're wasting a brilliant opportunity to pass because with a free kick, very unusually, there's space in the penalty area because the other team has to be 10 yards back. And they have to put a couple of guys, usually three or four at least, in the wall in case you do shoot. And so you have space in the penalty area to pass. So I think that the next step for data analysis is that teams are going to pass those free kicks unless you have Cristiano in your team. Now, I've been talking about dead balls, and those are hugely significant because about more than a third of goals in top-level football come from dead balls. But there's also progress being made in open play, analysis of open play. And I want to talk particularly here about Germany because they're really the leaders of data analysis in international football. And they got there through the Billy Bean connection. I mean, as you know, he's the 
Oakland A's general manager who pioneered this whole thing. And he's a Californian, knew nothing about soccer. Until a few years ago, he went to London on a romantic holiday with his wife. And he noticed all the newspapers here are full of football. And you walk around London, every pub has Bolton, Fulham, 4 p.m., don't miss signs in front. And he thought there's something going on here. And he got interested, and then he fell madly for soccer. Back home in California, he met Jürgen Klinsmann, who was then just a German expat living on Huntington Beach. And Klinsmann was interested in data analysis in American sport, <coughs> hung out at the A's bit, saw how it worked. And then Klinsmann in 2004 becomes manager of Germany. And pretty soon afterwards, middle of the night, the phone goes in the house of this professor at the Cologne Higher School for Sports, a guy called Jürgen Buschmann, one in the morning, and it's Klinsmann on the phone. And Klinsmann says, I want you to do a money ball of football for the German team. And Bushman says, OK. So he assembles colleagues and students into what is known in German football as Team Cologne. And it's interesting this happened in Germany. I think it's because they have a tradition of sports science going back nearly 100 years to when the first uh, faculty of sports science was founded in Berlin. So there's less skepticism than in other countries about the value of data in sport. So in 2006, Team Cologne produced what's probably the first serious penalty analysis in World Cup history for the Germany-Argentina quarterfinal. I don't know if you remember, but Jens Lehmann had the notes tucked in his sock, which he'd consult in between Argentine kicks. And in 2010, again Germany-Argentina in the quarters, Team Cologne came up with a, a messy strategy. And the basic idea, which might not sound incredibly complex, is that every time Messi has the ball, you have one German right on him and one German one yard behind so the, the, the second guy is for the second ball. They felt that's the way to maximize your chance of dispossessing Messi. Germany did win that game 4-0, although that might have been more due to the fact that the Argentine manager that day was Diego Maradona. And they learned the hard way that theory is not practice, because for Germany, Spain, uh, the semi-final in 2010, which they lost 1-0, the data analysts watched the video many times afterwards to try and work out what had gone wrong. And they saw the German lines were seven meters behind where they had been supposed to be in the game against Spain. And that's the problem with Spain. They don't let you do exactly what you want. Still, Euro 2012, Germany lead this field, and they have students living off coffee at Team Cologne doing data analysis day and night. And for every game, Joachim Löw, the German coach, has dossiers several hundred pages <coughs> thick on each opponent. And the amazing thing is this information isn't just produced, it's actually used learn his assistants in the hotel in Gdansk in Poland are actually studying these reports and uh, basing strategy on it. And so what's in these reports? Things like the usual running and passing routes for each opposing player, or how do you know when Cristiano Ronaldo is going to do a step over? And before the Germany-Portugal game, the German right back uh, Boateng was given an individual briefing on uh, Cristiano. How many seconds does each individual opponent take to shift from attack to defense when the ball is lost? And this is pretty useful stuff. But the game where it probably paid off most was Germany-Holland. Because the German team has a secret code book. This sounds like uh, thriller fiction, but they really do. And one rule in the code book apparently is that the ideal space between defenders in a back four is eight meters. And that's what Germany aspire to do. And watching the Dutch on video before the team Cologne spotted something interesting, which was the Dutch were leaving much larger gaps. They were straying. Beyond, defenders were straying beyond eight meters in distance from each other. So this is a uh, focus of the report. And in the group game, Germany found those gaps. If we can see the video, Neil. Um, I mean, I was, I was at that game. And as a, as a Dutch fan, I was appalled. But it's interesting seeing it again when you know the data analysis has gone in. This is not a great video, but you see the size of the gaps. That's Gomez's first goal. And it makes more sense when you see it like a kind of American football where these are plays, these are studied plays, rather than just players spontaneously using instinct. There comes Schweinsteiger, Gomez, huge gap, goal. Thanks. Now, you could argue that Holland's defensive positioning was so bad that Germany were bound to win, but it probably helps when you know what you're looking for. And suddenly, internally, after the 2-1 victory, Team Cologne got a lot of credit. 
Okay, Stats didn't win Euro 2012. Germany lost to Italy because of two horrendous individual errors. You might remember Philippe Lam being in the wrong place when the ball is hit, long ball is hit over his head to Balotelli. And Stats sometimes decide football competitions, but generally they don't. And I put this to Billy Bean once. I said, look, in baseball, Stats were transformative. They changed the whole game. And in football, they might not. And he said it doesn't have to be transformative. He said in soccer, probably stats will just give you an edge. That's all it will do. But he said that's enough. If it gives you an edge, then every serious team has to do it. And the logic is that data analysis becomes a normal part of football, even if it doesn't change the game, even if it doesn't turn the game on its head. Now, we're still in the early stages of that, that process. And we don't know a lot. And that's what Liverpool found to their cost. Because commonly, friend and students of Billy Beans, actually lived in Northern California, was an A's fan, and he becomes technical director of Liverpool, and the stats show, he, he's going to do a money ball of football, the stats show that two of the best passers in the Premier League are Stuart Downing and Jordan Henderson. And in fact, you can find Henderson and Downing in various statistical top tens in the CIES Football Observatory book for the 2010-11 season. I found them there, although I'm sure Connolly's research was much more in-depth. And then he gets Andy <coughs> Carroll, who's the best guy at conversing crosses, and he puts them all together. And it sounds good, but unfortunately, as we learn more about data in football, we learn that crosses are a terrible way to score goals. So, commonly had bet the company on a crossing strategy. You cross the ball to Carroll's head, and crosses don't really work. There's a blogger who identifies himself just as a Liverpool-supporting atmospheric scientist. He's one of these excellent number crunchers who study football as a hobby outside clubs. And he analysed Liverpool's play last year. And he found they hit more crosses than any other team in the Premier League. But, he writes, their conversion from crosses was simply atrocious. They required a staggering 421 open play crosses to score a single goal in, on average in open play last season. This was the worst rate in the entire league. So, crossing doesn't make much sense. It's fine with a free kick because there you have the time and the space to achieve accuracy. But to send a guy racing down the wing with a defender breathing down his neck and hope that he'll put the ball across on the centre forward's noggin, that's hopeless. So the Liverpool experiment actually taught us a bit more about which data really do matter. And that's progress of sorts. Unfortunately, the Liverpool failure has negatively affected public opinion of this sphere. But still, in football, we're seeing a slow trend away from scepticism towards acceptance of numbers. Sports stats have gained credibility in football thanks to their success in sports like baseball or British cycling. And in the wake of Jose Mourinho, we've also seen a shift towards more managers who haven't played top-level football, like Brendan Rodgers, Roy Hodgson, André Villas-Boas, people who are less likely to trust gut, more likely to trust numbers. And conversely, what has happened to the managerial careers of charismatic ex-stars like Maradona, Brian Robson, Roy Keane, Ruud Gillis, and so on? These people don't work in football anymore. And I'm confident we're soon going to make more breakthroughs. We're going to find out more truths from stats. The problem, I think, is that only a small group of people, really all of you in this room, are professionally involved in data analysis in football. And many of you are understandably overwhelmed by the flood of numbers that comes in from the data providers every day. Often you're not sufficiently heard within your clubs, and so you just don't have the time or the opportunity often to find new truths in data. So the people who are going to do that are the army of number crunchers outside, like that Liverpool supporting atmospheric scientist, or people like Bill James, who, as we know, was a janitor in a pork and beans factory before he revolutionized baseball. I want to leave you with an email I got recently along these lines. It said, Mr. Cooper, I'm a recent PhD graduate from MIT. My background involves some areas of applied math or data science, such as pattern recognition and statistical methods. I'm a big soccer fan, more specifically an Arsenal fan. My ambition is to apply myself in the world of football analytics. I was wondering if you, ha if you have any tips. For example, I have not yet been able to locate a contact person at Arsenal FC, and so on. So in short, data in football has got a lot further already than some of you might think in more despondent moments, and I suspect we ain't seen nothing yet. But I'm just an outsider, and I look forward to hearing more from all of you insiders over the course of today. Thank you very much.